Okay, so welcome to this video and today we are going to talk about photo stability study because photo stability study is very important as per as two aspects are concerned. The first one is uh, understanding the nature, the very first nature of the product or API in terms of its photo stability, whether the drug substance or drug product is photo labile. And the second aspect is understanding the, uh, you know, the stability indicating nature of the method. If there are degradants coming out of the photo effect, are those degradants well separated? So in second aspects, you will also get support from the photo stability to develop a suitable stability indicating analytical method. So let us begin with the presentation now. So these are the six important points that we are going to discuss today. The first one is the purpose. So what is the purpose of the study? The first one is to develop a suitable packaging systems. So what packaging materials are needed in case if you have to protect the product from the photo effect, the light, to understand photo stability of the product. You would also like to understand whether there is an impact of sunlight or EV radiations on to the stability of the product and the third one is to develop a suitable stability indicating method. So these are the three important purposes behind conducting the photo stability. So what is the first second one? The second point is the study design and this is very important aspects of the entire photo stability. There are nine points. Let us talk about the point number one. See in case of only API, you need not to worry about the drug products. But in case of drug products, you can begin the study by starting exposure of the APIs to the conditions that we are going to discuss in the point number three. So take the drug substance, maybe into a suitable container like a petri dish and then spread equally with not more than three mm of the thickness, right? So the second point is drug product outside of the immediate pack. So the API has been charged into the photo stability chamber. Then take the drug product like a tablet, remove the tablet from the blister, right? And put the tablets into a Petri dish and then store into the photo stability chamber. So immediate pack is what here? The immediate pack is nothing but the blister. The third point is, if needed, you can also you can also charge the drug product with the immediate pack, right? So, and we'll talk about that uh, in decision flow chart in the point number five. But for this point, for this time, let us understand the second, the third point is what the drug product packed into the immediate pack can be charged for the photo stability study. The point number four is drug product in the marketing pack or the secondary pack. So the primary pack or immediate pack is your blister. So secondary pack or the marketing pack can be carton. So you can also choose to expose the drug product in the carton that is in the marketing pack. And in case if required, you can also include the dark control. The dark control can be uh, made by wrapping the drug product or wrapping the API into a aluminum foil so that the UV or fluorescent white light will never reach to the substance to the sample. So the drug dark control is required in case if you want to understand the secondary impact because of the oxidation. Secondary impact happening because of the the temperature inside the photo stability chamber. So that is the purpose of the dark control. You can always choose to have it. In case of drug product, right? In case of drug product, then you need to also expose the placebo in addition to API and the drug product. Now this particular point, six number point is applicable maybe during method development or during method validation. But it, not, it may not be really required in case of just evaluating the photo stability impact. The point number seven is, see it is also very important to avoid the any physical changes into the sample like sublimation, evaporation or melting of the sample. 
so this must be avoided as much as possible point number eight use chemically inert containers for liquid apis or the drug product so in case if your sample is in the liquid form so the petri dish probably may not work well so in that case you can select the appropriate containers but make sure that these containers are not going to hinder exposure to the photo stability exposure to the light like the course uh, containers can be selected right the course container can be selected in case if your drug product or drug substance is highly oxidative in the nature so you can always select the appropriate container and then point number nine is evaluate the physical properties so the the once the study is completed right the once the study is completed then you have to evaluate the physical as well as chemical characteristics of the api and the drug product so what points you can think of appearance clarity or color of the solution dissolution in case of drug products disintegration time in case of drug product assay and degradation so these are the parameters generally generally can be evaluated but also look at your specification and your specification can give a better idea which parameters must be studied so completely analyze the drug substance or product as per your specification okay so this is the study design i, I hope you have you must have understand the study design now so what is the procedure the point number 3 you need to expose you need to expose your sample for not less than 1.2 million lux hours of fluorescent white light sunlight and for not less than 200 watt hours per square meter of near uv light so this is the requirement given into the guideline that is the q1b photo stability of drug substance and the drug product so what are the light source specified into this guideline there are two different options provided option 1 uh, talks about the usage of single lamp that is d65 or id65 that is daylight or indoor light see our sunlight which hits the earth surface also contains certain amounts of uv radiation so this single lamp must able to provide the white fluorescent light and the near uv light so single lamp is sufficient in the option number 1 so what has to be considered and share it is on your screen artificial daylight fluorescent lamp combining visible and ultraviolet outputs so as i said it must able to provide the fluorescent visible fluorescent light and the ultraviolet light now this is much much deeper requirement a true d65 lamp should have a full white light spectrum plus uv radiations between 320 nanometer and 400 nanometer in a single lamp see the uv radiation the range is 200 nanometer to 400 nanometer but as per as photo stability requirement is concerned you need to have a source lamp which is only providing the radiations between 320 and 400 nanometer so you must be having a question that why only 320 to 400 nanometer right and the explanation to your question is it accounts for approximately 95% of the uv rays that reaches the earth surface so whatever uv radiations hitting on to the earth surface accounts in between 320 nanometer to 400 nanometer so that is the reason of selecting this particular wavelengths i hope you are clear and the point number 3 is generally option 1 is not used due to cost of the lamp and unavailability of this lamps that is d65 or id65 so you must have seen in your photo stability chamber also the option 2 probably must have been used and in option 2 you are going to use now separate sources separate sources for white fluorescent light and the uv radiation so let us have a look at the option 2 which is widely used and more economical and practicable 
right so you will have a cool white fluorescent lamp the cool white fluorescent lamp and the second one is a near uv fluorescent lamp so what is the requirement of the near uv fluorescent lamp so these are the requirements onto your screen so the spectral distribution from 320 nanometer to 400 nanometer i think you are i hope you are now clear on to why 320 nanometer to 400 nanometer maximum energy emission between 350 nanometer and 370 nanometer and this last one is a significant proportion of uv should be in both the bands of 320 to 360 and then 360 to 400 nanometer so this is the requirement described under ich guideline number q1b okay as per as your uv lamp source is concerned and the point number three is let us have an example to understand so uh right so what i'll do now now uh, let us understand how to calculate the required exposure time whether one day is sufficient or 30 hours are sufficient and in most of the cases all photostability chambers they will simultaneously radiate the white fluorescent light and the uv fluorescent light so let us understand with this example if you have a, a cool white light with the a power of 10,000 lux hours at the point of sample exposure. So your light source, right, the fluorescent light source, the white fluorescent light source is exposing 10,000 lux per hour. Then 120 hours would expose 1.2 million lux hours of the white fluorescent light. So you need to expose for 120 hours, right, to attain 1.2 million lux hours of the white fluorescent light similarly if your uva source means near uv source is having a power of 2 watts per square meter then 100 hours is going to expose right how much uh, watt hours the 200 watt hours per square meter so by this way you can easily understand uh, what is the required exposure time fantastic so let us move ahead with the decision flow chart now and decision flow chart is applicable only for the drug substance or drug product it is not applicable for method development or forced degradation study so what is the flow chart says study starts so you have started the study and you have now exposed uh, the api in case of api uh, photo stability study or in case of drug products you are supposed to expose this drug product directly to the uh, the uh, the photo stability chamber and you found that if you found that the whatever changes you know whatever changes happen to the api or drug product which is directly exposed is within your specification acceptance criteria your assay, your color, your degradants, dissolution, everything is within the specification. That means they are within the acceptable change. And hence, you can end the test over there itself. And you can conclude that, okay, my API or drug product is not labile to the photo. But in case if your dissolution is out of the limit, or in case if your degradants, impurities are out of the acceptance criteria, then this is not the acceptable change. And in that case, now you need to conduct the study with the immediate pack. Like in case of drug product, we have exposed the tablets, bare tablets into a petri dish, which has resulted into no acceptable change. Now moving ahead, you can think of exposing the similar tablets, but with the immediate pack. So do not remove the tablets from the immediate pack and expose these tablets packed into the immediate packs like blister. What happens next? Does the now such exposed tablets meet the specification? Are they within the acceptable change? If answer is yes to this, then you can conclude the test over there itself, right? You can conclude and saying that, okay, now the moment I put the tablets inside the blister pack, they are meeting the specification. So the product is photolabile, but it is not 
going to harm the quality of the product into the immediate pack. But in case if you are still found that the tablets are not meeting the specification, that is no acceptable change, then you need to think of the marketing pack. So there is a secondary pack like a carton, right? blister followed by the carton so expose the drug product along with the carton now so there is a drug product packed into the blister and the blister packed into the carton and that has to be exposed to the photo stability study so there can be two different possibilities acceptable change in the study but in case if say still your test results are not acceptable not within the specification then what this indicates, this indicates that you need to redesign the packaging or reformulate your product so that it will not be unstable. It will not be photolabile, though it is photolabile, but the packaging condition can be in such a way that it will protect your drug substance or product from the light. Okay, so this is the essence of the decision flow chart as i said earlier decision flow chart is not applicable to the forced degradation study because their intention is completely different you need to understand what is really happening to the drug substance or drug product and whether my method is able to detect all those changes now what are the examples of the apis which are photolabile and this is just for your information you know and these are the group of the APIs which are photolabile, right? So I hope you must have now understood what is the purpose of the photo stability study, how to design the photo stability study, what is the exposure requirement, how to select the source, what is the decision flow chart requirement, right? Thank you very much for watching this video till the end and I hope to meet you soon with such kind of useful and informative videos till then take care and bye bye see you soon